So this is the first part of the videos for week five in our Christian Evidences class where we're looking at apologetics. Of course, uh, apologetics comes from the Greek word apologia, a rationally sound demonstration of Christian truth. We've talked about the nature of truth. We've talked about the effectiveness of apologetics in today's world. We've talked about the problem of evil. Today I'd like to look at one of the classical arguments for the existence of God. So what I'm going to do is, in this first part of the lecture, discuss Anselm's ontological argument. And then, uh, in the second and third videos, I want to share with you the radio recordings from the BBC, the recordings of C.S. Lewis uh, in wartime Britain. The recordings were talks that C.S. Lewis gave to um, the British audience arguing for Christianity. Those talks be later became a book that we call Mere Christianity. Before they were it, uh, compiled into a book, they were uh, broadcasts, and so I'll share with you two of uh, the chapters from that book um, that are basically mock recordings. They're not actually Lewis's voice. Um, so that you can experience what it would have been like to have heard his arguments for God's existence based on what he called the law of nature or what we might call the moral law. So that, that'll be videos two and three. But in this first video, I want to cover one of the classical arguments from God, for God. And what I'll do in uh, later videos, for uh, later weeks, or cover some of the other classical arguments for the existence of God. So we've got the ontological argument this week, then we'll talk about later the um, teleological argument, and then also the uh, cosmological argument, or the um, Kalam argument. But this, this week, let's talk about uh, Anselm and his ontological argument, because uh, it frequently comes up in discussions of apologetics. Anselm is Anselm of Canterbury, which of course is an important city in England. Now, if you go to Canterbury, you're not going to think it's necessarily um, so important. It's in, on the southeast coast of England, but its significance lies in the fact that the most important office in the Church of England is found there. Um, so the Bishop of Canterbury is the Archbishop of the Church of England. So he's the Archbishop, Archbishop of Canterbury. Now this is true in the Church of England. Back in Anselm's, Anselm's time, of course, uh, England was a Catholic nation. And so he was Archbishop of Canterbury, which at the time meant he was the highest ranking Catholic official in England. The interesting thing is he wasn't an Englishman. He actually uh, came from mainland Europe, and he had his own run-ins with various Catholic officials, um, but England was a safe place for him to be. Uh, he actually wanted to leave England at some point, but was uh, not allowed to do so. Anyway, Anselm was an interesting study by himself. He's a 12th century classical Christian figure, and he offered up what's often called the ontological argument for God. Now let's talk about the word ontological for a minute. Now, ontology has to do with the study of being. So, it is um, interested in the essence of things. What are things at their most essential? Uh, so, the word essential means uh, of the essence. The ontological argument offered by Anselm works like this. He asked himself, he said, I began to ask myself whether there might be found a single argument, an argument for God, which would require no other for its proof than itself alone, and alone would suffice to demonstrate that God truly exists. So he wanted to offer an argument for God based purely on reason, not on any external evidence. So it's an argument completely based on rational, logical argument that didn't uh, rely on any external evidence. That's unlike all the other elements of apologetics we talk about. We're always pointing outward in apologetics. Look at the Bible. 
um, look at science, uh, look at human behavior, but not the ontological argument. It doesn't rely on human behavior. It doesn't rely on fossil evidence. It doesn't rely on anything external other than the uh, human reason. So we're going to talk about uh, that argument and the strengths and weaknesses for it. So here we go. What does the ontological argument offered by Anselm of Canterbury entail? Well, first of all, Anselm says, God is by definition the greatest conceivable being. So keep that in mind. When we talk about the greatest conceivable being, this is Anselm's definition of God. So the GCB, or greatest conceivable being, is God. And he defines him that way because um, it will ultimately help in this ontological argument. A greatest conceivable being, God, is one whom we could never consider uh, another greater. So um, whatever your picture of God is, make it the greatest it could possibly be. Okay, that's the greatest conceivable being. Now, follow this logic. It may or may not convince you. He says it's greater for a thing to exist in someone's mind and reality than only in someone's mind. So it's better for something to exist not only in your mind, but also in reality, than only in someone's mind. Number three, either God exists both in mind but not reality, or exists in both. So either he is something that we dreamed up and is not real, or he's something that we dreamed up because he's real. So I'd explain it this way. There are four possibilities. Number one, God exists in the mind. In other words, we just dream them up. The, the atheists say God is just a crutch that we've invented. So he, God exists in our mind. Number two option is God exists in the mind and reality. Not only do we conceive of him, but that he also is a real being. The third option would be God exists in reality, but not in the mind. And the last one would be God exists neither in reality nor in the mind. Well, obviously, these two options don't work. We can't say God exists in reality, but not in the mind, because we're talking about him now. We're thinking about him. So he definitely exists in the mind. No one would deny that. Secondly, God exists neither in reality nor in the mind. Well, again, that one's um, ruled out because he does exist in the mind. So we really have these two options. And some says God exists in the mind, or God exists in the mind and reality. Well, he says, uh, oh, okay, I'll, I'll, let me go back and refer to this. Um, this is an old from the 90s graphic that I got off the internet, and it's obvious it's from the 90s because of the low quality and also the reference to uh, Bill Clinton. So um, what this is is a Venn diagram that compares things that exist in the understanding or in the mind and things that exist in reality. Okay, So there are things that exist in the understanding, like Atlantis and trolls, but that don't exist in reality. So they're outside of uh, things that exist in reality. There are things that do exist in reality. Uh, Bill Clinton, the son, and uh, Fred Rosen, I assume he's the person who made this graphic. He exists in the understanding. In other words, we know them. I don't know who Fred Rosen is, but Bill Clinton and the son, we, not only has the thought come in mind of Bill Clinton or the son, but also we know that these things really exist. But we also know that there are things that exist we don't know yet. So, for instance, undiscovered planets, undiscovered species, particles. Um, we know there are things we don't know that do exist. The best things, and some says, not only exist in understanding, but they also exist in reality. So, one real Bill Clinton is better than one dreamed up troll. Okay, that's the argument. So, let's suppose that God exists in mind, but not reality. And some says, well, that would mean that he's not the greatest conceivable being, right? Because it's better to exist in mind and reality than simply in someone's mind. So that means it's impossible for him to be the greatest conceivable being. Therefore, God exists in mind and reality. Therefore, God exists. That's Anselm's ontological argument. Now, you might need to rewind the video and go through it again, but this is the basis of the argument. It's all based on this idea of the greatest conceivable being. Do you buy it?
Well, Rene Descartes, um, who of course was the uh, Renaissance philosopher um, and uh, mind extraordinaire, he argued much the same way, um, although he did not mention Anselm, he said in his fifth meditation, but if the mere fact that I can produce from my thought the idea of something that entails everything, that I clearly and distinctly perceive to belong to that thing really does belong to it, is it is not this a possible basis for another argument to prove the existence of God? Certainly the idea of God, our supremely perfect being, that's what Descartes calls him, supremely perfect being, is one that I find within me just as surely as the idea of any shape or number. And my understanding that it belongs to his nature that he exists, always exists, is no less clear and distinct than is the case when I prove of any shape or number that some property belongs to its nature. So he says, if I know all the properties of the number five, that's evidence that five exists. Same thing with God, but um, kind of uh, amped up because he is the supremely perfect being, Descartes says. Well, even when Anselm published his argument in the Proslogion, his ontological argument, there were people, believers, who weren't so sure about it. So one was um, a fellow monk named Gaunillo. And Gaunillo offered what he called the um, a GCI. Instead of the greatest conceivable being, the GCB, he offered the GCI. He wrote in his work, In Defense of the Fool. In other words, the Bible says, the fool is said in his art, there is no God. And Ganoyo, who did believe in God, said, well, look, this argument itself doesn't work, so I'm going to defend it like a fool would. Okay, Although he's not uh, actually arguing there isn't a God, he just says this argument is flawed. He says, let's talk about, instead of a greatest conceivable being, let's talk about a greatest conceivable island. It's a lost island. We haven't seen it. The lost island is that than which no greater can be conceived. The greatest conceivable island. So do that. Con think of the greatest conceivable island. Now, in your mind, it might be um, Gilligan's Island. But no, he says it's even better than that. Okay. So whatever your best island uh, you can imagine is, go ahead and try to imagine something even greater. Now, of course, as Anselm says, it's greater to exist in reality than merely as an idea. Of course, following with Anselm's logic, if the lost island does not exist, one can conceive of an even greater island that is one that does exist. Therefore, he says the lost island exists in reality. So there must be an island that is even greater than the island that you are imagining. But this is absurd. It's an argument from uh, reductio ad absurdum. So you, you take an argument and follow it out to its logical conclusion to show that it's ridiculous. That's uh, what he's using here. He says Anselm's argument has the same structure, therefore the argument is valid. And I think there probably is something to this. I'm not a huge fan of the ontological argument. I'll admit that it's, it's um, um, so... Um, not hypothetical, but that it is so ethereal and uh, so deep that I have trouble following it. But um, I'll, since I also teach math, maybe you've had me as your math teacher here at uh, Ambridge, uh, I, I think, think in mathematical terms a lot. And I think of it this way. Um, if we're going to argue for the greatest conceivable integer, so think of the integers. What is the greatest conceivable integer? And you can see how uh, I'm trying to set this up. The problem is there is no such thing as the greatest conceivable integer because there's always one greater than it, right? Whatever integer you think of as being the greatest conceivable integer, you just add one to it and you've got an even greater one. And I think there probably is something in that kind of logic to say, I don't know that we can talk about the greatest conceivable being either. I don't know that, that, we, that such a thing even makes logical sense, just like the greatest conceivable integer does not. Well, you'll see in your slides also that Immanuel Kant uh, argued that um, existence is not a property, so you can't use it to prove anything. Um, and we'll say more about that later. I just wanted you to see that uh, Santa Claus uh, comes into the equation uh, when we uh, answer Immanuel Kant's objection. So these slides will be available. Now on to C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity.